Section 3 of Inca Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Inca Land by Hiram Bingham. Chapter 2 Climbing Corapuna. Part 1 the desert plateau above Chiquibamba is nearly 2,500 feet higher than the town, and it was nine o'clock in the morning of October 10th before we got out of the valley. Thereafter Corapuna was always in sight, and as we slowly approached it we studied it with care. The plateau has an elevation of over 15,000 feet, yet the mountain stood out conspicuously above it. Corapuna is really a range about 20 miles long its gigantic massif was covered with snowfields from one end to the other so deep did the fresh snow lie that it was generally impossible to see where snowfields ended and glaciers began we could see that of the five well-defined peaks the middle one was probably the lowest the two next highest are at the right or eastern end of the massif the culminating truncated dome at the western end with its smooth uneroded sides apparently belonged to a later volcanic period than the rest of the mountain it seemed to be the highest peak of all to reach it did not appear to be difficult rock-covered slopes ran directly up to the snow snowfields without many rock falls appeared to culminate in a saddle at the base of the great snowy dome the eastern slope of the dome itself offered an unbroken if steep path to the top if we could once reach the snow line it looked as though with the aid of ice creepers or snowshoes we could climb the mountain without serious trouble between us and the first snow-covered slopes however lay more than twenty miles of volcanic desert intersected by deep canyons steep quebradas and very rough ah ah lava directed by our guide we left the cotahuasi road and struck across country dodging the lava flows and slowly ascending the gentle slope of the plateau as it became steeper our mules showed signs of suffering while waiting for them to get their wind we went ahead on foot climbed a short rise and to our surprise and chagrin found ourselves on the rim of a steep walled canyon one thousand five hundred feet deep which cut right across in front of the mountain and lay between us and its higher slopes after the mules had rested the guide now decided to turn to the left instead of going straight toward the mountain a dispute ensued as to how much he knew even about the foot of corapuna he denied that there were any huts whatever in the canyon abandonado despoblado desierto a waste a solitude a wilderness so he described it had he been there no senor luckily we had been able to make out from the rim of the canyon two or three huts near a little stream as there was no question that we ought to get to the snow line as soon as possible we decided to dispense with the services of so well informed a guide and make such way as we could alone the altitude of the rim of the canyon was sixteen thousand feet the mules showed signs of acute distress from mountain sickness the arrieros began to complain loudly but did what they could to relieve the mules by punching holes in their ears the theory being that bloodletting is a good thing for soroche as soon as the timid arrieros reached a point where they could see down into the canyon they spotted some patches of green pasture cheered up a bit and even smiled over the dismal ignorance of the guide soon we found a trail which led to the huts near the huts was a taciturn indian woman who refused to furnish us with either fuel or forage although we tried to pay in advance and offered her silver nevertheless we proceeded to pitch our tents and took advantage of the sheltering stone wall of her corral for our campfire. after peace had settled down 
and it became perfectly evident that we were harmless, the door of one of the huts opened and an Indian man appeared. Doubtless the cause of his disappearance before our arrival had been the easily discernible presence in our midst of the brass buttons of Corporal Gamarra. Possibly he who had selected this remote corner of the wilderness for his abode had a guilty conscience, and at the sight of a gendarme, decided that he had better hide at once. More probably, however, he feared the visit of a recruiting party, since it is quite likely that he had not served his legal term of military service. At all events, when his wife discovered that we were not looking for her man, she allowed his curiosity to overcome his fears. We found that the Indians kept a few llamas. They also made crude pottery, firing it with straw and llama dung. They lived almost entirely on gruel made from chuño, frozen bitter potatoes. Little else than potatoes will grow at 14,000 feet above the sea. For neighbors the Indians had a solitary old man who lived half a mile up nearer the glaciers, and a small family a mile and a half down the valley. Before dark the neighbors came to call, and we tried our best to persuade the men to accompany us up the mountain and help to carry the loads from the point where the mules would have to stop, but they declined absolutely and positively. I think one of the men might have gone, but as soon as his quiet, well-behaved wife saw him wavering, she broke out in a torrent of violent denunciation, telling him the mountain would eat him up, and that unless he wanted to go to heaven before his time, he had better let well enough alone and stay where he was. Cieza de Leon, one of the most careful of the early chroniclers, 1550, says that at Corapuna, the devil, talks more freely than usual. Quote, For some secret reason known to God, it is said that devils walk visibly about in that place, and that the Indians see them and are much terrified. I have also heard that these devils have appeared to Christians in the form of Indians. End quote. Perhaps the voluble housewife was herself one of the famous Corapuna devils. She certainly talked more freely than usual. Or possibly she thought that the Corapuna devils were now appearing to Indians in the form of Christians. Anyhow, the Indians said that on top of Corapuna there was a delightful, warm paradise containing beautiful flowers, luscious fruits, parrots of brilliant plumage, macaws, and even monkeys, those faithful denizens of hot climates. The souls of the departed stop to rest and enjoy themselves in this charming spot on their upward flight. Like most primitive people who live near snow-capped mountains, they had an abject terror of the forbidding summits and the snowstorms that seemed to come down from them. Probably the Indians hoped to propitiate the demons who dwell on the mountain tops by inventing charming stories relating to their abode. It is interesting to learn that in the neighboring hamlet of Pampacoca, the great explorer Raimondi in 1865 found the natives, quote, exiled from the civilized world, still preserving their primitive customs, carrying idols to the slopes of the great snow mountain Corapuna, and there offering them as a sacrifice, end quote. Apparently the mountain still inspires fear in the hearts of all those who live near it. The fact that we agreed to pay in advance unheard-of wages, ten times the usual amount earned by laborers in this vicinity, that we added offers of the precious coca leaves, the greatly to be desired fire water, the rarely seen tobacco, and other good things usually coveted by Peruvian highlanders, had no effect in the face of the terrors of the mountain. They knew only too well that snow-blindness was one of the least of ills to be encountered, while the advantages of dark-colored glasses, warm clothes, kerosene stoves, and plenty of good food, which we freely offered, 
were far too remote from the realm of credible possibilities. Professor Cuello understood all these matters perfectly, and being able to speak Quechua, the language of our prospective carriers, did his best in the way of argument, not only out of loyalty to the expedition, but because Peruvian gentlemen always regard the carrying of a load as extremely undignified and improper. I have known one of the most energetic and efficient businessmen in Peru, a highly respected gentleman in a mountain city, to so dislike being obliged to carry a rolled and unmounted photograph, little larger than a lead pencil, that he sent for a cargador, an Indian porter, to bear it for him. As a matter of fact, Professor Coelho was perfectly willing to do his share and more, but neither he nor we were anxious to climb with heavy packs on our backs, in the rarefied air of elevations several thousand feet higher than Mont Blanc. The argument with the Indians was long and verbose, and the offerings of money and goods were made more and more generous. All was in vain. We finally came to realize that whatever supplies and provisions were carried up Corapuna would have to be borne on our own shoulders. That evening the top of the truncated dome, which was just visible from the valley near our camp, was bathed in a roseate alpine glow, unspeakably beautiful. The air, however, was very bitter, and the neighboring brook froze solid. During the night the gendarme's mule became homesick and disappeared with Coello's horse. Camara was sent to look for the strays, with orders to follow us as soon as possible. As no bearers or carriers were to be secured, it was essential to persuade the Tejadas to take their pack-mules up as far as the snow, a feat they declined to do. The mules, Don Pablo said, had already gone as far as, and farther, than mules had any business to go. Soon after reaching camp, Tucker had gone off on a reconnaissance. He reported that there was a path leading out of the canyon up to the llama pastures on the lower slopes of the mountains. The arrieros denied the accuracy of his observations. However, after a long argument, they agreed to go as far as there was a good path, and no farther. There was no question of our riding. It was simply a case of getting the loads as high up as possible before we had to begin to carry them ourselves. It may be imagined that the arrieros packed very slowly and grudgingly, although the loads were now considerably reduced. Finally, leaving behind our saddles, ordinary supplies, and everything not considered absolutely necessary for a two weeks stay on the mountain we set off we could easily walk faster than the loaded mules and thought it best to avoid trouble by keeping far enough ahead so as not to hear the arrieros constant complaints after an hour of not very hard climbing over a fairly good llama trail the tejadas stopped at the edge of the pastures and shouted to us to come back. We replied equally vociferously, calling them to come ahead, which they did for half an hour more, slowly zigzagging up a slope of coarse black volcanic sand. Then they not only stopped, but commenced to unload the mules. It was necessary to rush back and commence a violent and acrimonious dispute as to whether the letter of the contract had been fulfilled and the mules had gone, quote, as far as they could reasonably be expected to go, end quote. The truth was, the Tejadas were terrified at approaching mysterious Corapuna. They were sure it would take revenge on them by destroying their mules, who would certainly die the following day of Soroche. We offered a bonus of thirty soles, fifteen dollars, if they would go on for another hour, and threatened them with all sorts of things if they would not. At last they readjusted the loads and started climbing again. The altitude was now about 16,000 feet, but at the foot of a steep little rise the arrieros stopped again, 
This time they succeeded in unloading two mules before we could scramble down over the sand and boulders to stop them. Threats and prayers were now of no avail. The only thing that would satisfy was a legal document. They demanded an agreement in writing that in case any mule or mules died as a result of this foolish attempt to get up to the snow line, I should pay in gold two hundred soles for each and every mule that died. Further, I must agree to pay a bonus of fifty soles if they would keep climbing until noon or until stopped by snow. This document, having been duly drawn up by Professor Coello, seated on a lava rock amidst the clinker-like cinders of the old volcano, was duly signed and sealed. In order that there might be no dispute as to the time, my best chronometer was handed over to Pablo Tejada to carry until noon. The mules were reloaded, and again the ascent began. Presently the mules encountered some pretty bad going, on a steep slope covered with huge lava boulders and scoriaceous sand. We expected more trouble every minute. However, the arrieros, having made an advantageous bargain, did their best to carry it out. Fortunately, the mules reached the snow line just fifteen minutes before twelve o'clock. The Tejadas lost no time in unloading, claimed their bonus, promised to return in ten days, and almost before we knew it had disappeared down the side of the mountain. We spent the afternoon establishing our base camp. We had three tents, the Mummery, a very light and diminutive wall tent about four feet high, made by Edgington of London, an ordinary wall tent, seven by seven, of fairly heavy material with floor sewed in, and an improved pyramidal tent, made by David Abercrombie, but designed by Mr. Tucker after one used on Mount McKinley by Professor Parker. Tucker's tent had two openings, a small vent in the top of the pyramid, capable of being closed by an adjustable cap in case of storm, and an oval entrance through which one had to crawl. This opening could be closed to any desired extent with a pucker string, a fairly heavy waterproof floor, measuring seven by seven, was sewed into the base of the pyramid so that a single pole, without guy ropes, was all that was necessary to keep the tent upright after the floor had been securely pegged to the ground or snow. Tucker's tent offered the advantages of being carried without difficulty, easily erected by one man, readily ventilated, and yet giving shelter to four men in any weather. We proposed to leave the wall tent at the base, but to take the pyramidal tent with us on the climb. We determined to carry the mummery to the top of the mountain to use while taking observations. The elevation of the base camp was 17,300 feet. We were surprised and pleased to find that at first we had good appetites and no soroche. Less than a hundred yards from the wall tent was a small diurnal stream, fed by melting snow. Whenever I went to get water for cooking or washing purposes, I noticed a startling and rapid rise in pulse and increasing shortness of breath. My normal pulse is seventy. After I walked slowly a hundred feet on a level at this altitude, it rose to one twenty. After I had been seated a while, it dropped down to one hundred. Gradually our sense of well-being departed and was followed by a feeling of malaise and general disability. There was a splendid sunset but we were too sick and cold to enjoy it. That night all slept badly and had some headache. A high wind swept around the mountain and threatened to carry away both of our tents. As we lay awake, wondering at what moment we should find ourselves deserted by the frail canvas shelters, we could not help thinking that Coropuna was giving us a fair warning of what might happen higher up. For breakfast we had pemmican, hardtack, pea soup, and tea. We all wanted plenty of sugar in our tea and drank large quantities of it. Experience on Mount McKinley had led Tucker to believe heartily in the advantages of pemmican, a food especially prepared for Arctic explorers. 
neither coelho nor gamarra nor i had ever tasted it before we decided that it is not very palatable on first acquaintance although doubtless of great value when one has to spend long periods of time in the arctic where even seal's blubber is a delicacy as good as cow's cream i presume we could have done just as well without it it was decided to carry with us from the base enough fuel and supplies to last through any possible misadventure even of a week's duration accounts of climbs in the high andes are full of failures due to the necessity of the explorers being obliged to return to food warmth and shelter before having effected the conquest of a new peak one remembers the frequent disappointments that came to such intrepid climbers as whimper in ecuador martin conway in bolivia and fitzgerald in chile and argentina due to high winds the sudden advent of terrific snowstorms and the weakness caused by soroche at the cost of carrying extra heavy loads we determined to try to avoid being obliged to turn back we could only hope that no unforeseen event would finally defeat our efforts tucker decided to establish a cache of food and fuel as far up the mountainside as he and coelho could carry fifty pounds in a single day's climb leaving me to reset the demoralized tents and do other chores they started off packing loads of about twenty-five pounds each to me their progress up the mountainside seemed extraordinarily slow were they never going to get anywhere their frequent stops seemed ludicrous i was to learn later that it is as difficult at a high elevation for one who is not climbing to have any sympathy for those suffering from soroche as it is for a sailor to appreciate the sensations of one who is seasick during the morning i set up the barometers and took a series of observations it was pleasant to note that the two new mountain aneroids registered exactly alike all the different units of the cargo that was to be taken up the mountain then had to be weighed so that they might be equitably distributed in our loads the following day we had two small kerosene stoves with primus burners our grub ordered months before specially for this climb consisted of pemmican in eight and a quarter pound tins cola chocolate in half pound tins seeded raisins in one pound tins cube sugar in four pound tins hard tack in six and a half pound tins jam sticks of dried pea soup plasmon biscuit tea and a few of silver's self-heating mess tins containing irish stew beef a la mode et al corporal gamarra appeared during the day having found his mule which had strayed twelve miles down the canyon he did not relish the prospect of climbing corapuna but when he saw the warm clothes which we had provided for him and learned that he would get a bonus of five gold sovereigns on top of the mountain he decided to accept his duties philosophically tucker and coelho returned in the middle of the afternoon reported that there seemed to be no serious difficulties in the first part of the climb and that a cache had been established about two thousand feet above the base camp on a snowfield tucker now assigned our packs for the morrow and skillfully prepared the tump lines and harness with which we were to carry them notwithstanding an unusual headache which lasted all day long i still had some appetite our supper consisted of pemmican pudding with raisins hardtack and pea soup which every one was able to eat if not to enjoy that night we slept better one reason being that the wind did not blow as hard as it had the night before the weather continued fine watkins was due to arrive from araquipa in a day or two but we decided not to wait for him or run any further risk of encountering an early summer snowstorm the next morning after adjusting our fifty pound loads to our unaccustomed backs we left camp about nine o'clock we wore appalachian mountain club snow creepers or crampons heavy scotch mittens knit woolen helmets 
dark blue snow glasses, and very heavy clothing. It will be remembered by visitors to the Zermatt Museum that the Swiss guides who once climbed Huascaran in the northern Peruvian Andes had been maimed for life by their experiences in the deep snows of those great altitudes. We determined to take no chances, and in order to prevent the possibility of frostbite, each man was ordered to put on four pairs of heavy woolen socks and two or three pairs of heavy underdrawers. Professor Coelho and Corporal Gamarra wore large heavy boots. I had woolen puttees and arctic overshoes. Tucker improvised what he regarded as highly satisfactory sandals out of felt slippers and pieces of a rubber poncho. Since there seemed to be no rock climbing ahead of us, we decided to depend on crampons rather than on the heavy hob-nailed climbing boots with which alpinists are familiar. The snow was very hard until about one o'clock. By three o'clock it was so soft as to make further progress impossible. We found that, loaded as we were, we could not climb a gentle rise faster than twenty steps at a time. On the more level snow fields we took twenty-five or thirty steps before stopping to rest. At the end of each stint it seemed as though they would be the last steps we should ever take. Panting violently, fatigued beyond belief, and overcome with mountain sickness, we would stop and lean on our ice axes until able to take twenty-five steps more. It did not take very long to recover one's wind. Finally, we reached a glacier marked by a network of crevasses, none very wide, and nearly all covered with snow bridges. We were roped together, and although there was an occasional fall, no great strain was put on the rope. Then came great snowfields with not a single crevasse. For the most part, our day was simply an unending succession of stints, twenty-five steps and a rest repeated four or five times, and followed by thirty-five steps and a longer rest, taken lying down in the snow. We pegged along until about half-past two, when the rapidly melting snow stopped all progress. At an altitude of about 18,450 feet, the Tucker tent was pitched on a fairly level snowfield. We now noticed with dismay that the two big aneroids had begun to differ. As the sun declined, the temperature fell rapidly. At half-past five, the thermometer stood at twenty-two degrees Fahrenheit. During the night, the minimum thermometer registered nine degrees Fahrenheit. We noticed a considerable number of lightning flashes in the northeast. They were not accompanied by any thunder, but alarmed us considerably. We feared the expected November storms might be ahead of time. We closed the tent door on account of a biting wind. Owing to the ventilating device at the top of the tent, we managed to breathe fairly well. Mountain climbers at high altitudes have occasionally observed that one of the symptoms of acute soroche is a very annoying, racking cough, as violent as whooping cough, and frequently accompanied by nausea. We had not experienced this at 17,000 feet, but now it began to be painfully noticeable and continued during the ensuing days and nights, particularly nights, until we got back to the Indians' huts again. We slept very poorly and continually awakened one another by coughing. End of section 3